Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Malik Pancholi. I am the chair and co-founder of Act to Change, and I am so excited to welcome you to our second Classroom Convo, end of semester chat. It is December, which means that not only are many of us celebrating various holidays, it also means that there are only a few weeks left in 2020. And I know it's been quite a year. Along with the current surge of COVID rates, we have also been dealing with a rise in xenophobic, racist harassment and violence against Asian Americans caused by misinformation about the coronavirus. And we have witnessed the national uprisings that remind us that truly black lives matter. We've all had to adjust to this pandemic, uh, excuse me, pandemic world that we live in with many of us having to go to work and school virtually. And we're adapting to a society where human connection is lacking and the communities that we have built are harder to maintain. So with all that in mind, we wanted to help students, parents, educators, community leaders learn some ways to support youth as they combat COVID-19 related discrimination and to discuss ways for us to ensure that the environments that we use to reconnect are safe, nurturing, and validating for all of us, especially for Asian American and Pacific Islander youth during these tough times. So in partnership with McDonald's and Next Shark, we are incredibly excited to have this conversation with everyone today. So I'm really excited to introduce our first panel today. It features a special guest as our facilitator. He is a valued member of our Act to Change Advisory Council, but you know him as a star of Fresh Off the Boat. Please welcome Hudson Yang. As the was, a has been a star of the Vote, but yeah. not in my <laughs> always, always a star. Thank you so much for being here today, Hudson. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be uh, here. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So, um, you, you're like one of our model uh, uh, advisory council members because every time we do an event, we pull you away from something. Wait, the last time we did one that you were on, it was your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe you were supposed to take the SATs today. Is that right? I was supposed to, but you know, lucky for me, of course, uh, it got canceled. So I got to relax and enjoy the day, you know, instead of amazing, amazing. Well, I'm glad that it gave you free time to do this with us today. But I also think that's an interesting segue because I know like a lot of stuff has changed, especially like in the school space because of COVID-19, including the SAT test. And so I will let you now run with this next panel to talk about uh, how young people are dealing with COVID-19. Thank you. And before I start, I just want to say, you know, at I'm really thankful for everything Act Change is doing. I mean, especially as someone who has been bullied myself, it's really an honor to just be here and support Act of Change's important mission as both a follower and a member of the National Advisory Board. So thank you, Malik, for having me. And also thank you, McDonald's, for your support. Um, so yeah, today I get to talk about the Asian Pacific Islander American Scholars Program and how it supports APIA college students with navigating 2020 and combating COVID-19 related bullying and discrimination. So today I'm here with Katrina Breeze, Vice President of Development of External Affairs at APIA Scholars. Uh, could you introduce yourself and the program? Hi, Hudson. Um, of course. So my name is Katrina Breeze, and I am Vice President of Development and External Affairs for an organization called APIA Scholars. Um, APIA is Asian and Pacific Islander American, of course. And so, um, you know, really core to our mission is supporting students really access college um, and and complete their degree and really help them in that college to career transition. Um, and so a lot of what we do is really supporting students so that they can get to college. And But we know that just getting a scholarship is part of the college experience. Um, a lot of what's really um, important for students to succeed in schools to get the programs and support services they need. Um, most of our scholars are first generation college students, um, you know, many of them wouldn't be able to afford um, school unless it was our scholarship um, or other financial aid. And so um, coming from the fact that I'm the first in the family to go to college myself, I had scholarships and, and financial aid and people who supported me in school. Um, a lot of what's important are, you know, the getting access to resources, whether it's on campus or through an organization like ours. Yeah, uh, it's true. It's really important too because my mom was also a first generation college uh, student and she didn't really have any scholarships or support. She kind of worked her entire like college, every, every day off of college, every every day after college, just working to pay for it. And I know if it would have been really helpful yeah. a group with you guys helping her out. 
So it's great. And I know it really must be challenging this time for students to navigate online learning. I mean, I know it's hard for me. Imagine <laughs> uh, on top of the hostile environment that, you know, Asian American communities are having because of, you know, misinformation and discrimination from the mm -hmm. virus. Uh, how has API scholars been helpful for, you know, just scholars navigating 2020 in general? Sure. Well, so, you know, earlier this year for us um, in March, we were gearing up to um, hold um, one, a, a large event in, um, in L.A. And obviously for us as an organization, um, I think it was really February, people were starting to cancel everything. Um, and that really sort of was the beginning of us really understanding that this was um, getting much bigger than we all expected. And part of one of the first things that we did was kind of pause and take a temperature check of what um, all of our scholars were experiencing on campus, whether it was um, racism, discrimination on campus, just really um, having a really hard time with their mental health and well being. Um, you know, I think that um, everyone, regardless of if you're a college student or not, has had some sort of difficulty really just. Um, kind of navigating, you know, what 2020 has been, not only just because of COVID-19, but, you know, the, the social justice movement and just the increasing temperature of everything going on in the world right now. And so we did a wellness check of our scholars um, and really started to um, try to, to take a look at what they were experiencing, what their needs were. Um, they had financial concerns. Um, they may have lost their jobs. Their parents lost employment. Loss of income was a very big concern. Um, and so we were able to pretty quickly deploy some emergency funds. Um, our partner McDonald's on, on this call today, this with this webinar today, as well as just for our organization was really generous this year and being able to increase their support for something like emergency funds. Um, we um, have continued our scholarships, but our scholarships also have the option to be able to defer up to a year. So if you're an upcoming freshman and you've decided to take a gap year, I know, um, you know, we've, we've talked about that yeah, before. Yeah. It's, it's something that if you've received a scholarship, you still would be able to apply it for, for the next year, if you decided to, to do that. Um, we also created some safe spaces for our scholars to be able to talk with one another um, in kind of a casual environment and talk about shared experiences. I think a lot of people, um, especially in the Asian community, we live in multi-generational households. Um, and, you know, the idea of moving back home from campus during COVID-19, possibly, you know, getting um, just exposing grandparents um, or other aunts and uncles and family members, you know, can be really stressful. Um, but so really what we what we did was just um, ensure that we knew how our scholars were doing and really see how we could deploy resources to respond to that. I just have one last question. I think it's uh, everyone's hoping, but, um, you know, as the year is like kind of ending off and finishing up, we're heading into 2021. You know, what are your hopes for, you know, how the school year and how the year in general will be next year, you know? Sure. Well, so, you know, my hope is that in the year ahead, um, people aren't discouraged from going to college, going to school, that despite all of the challenges, we still understand that really um, getting a, a college education can be the first step in just changing your the trajectory of your entire family tree. And so I'm hoping that we can all you know, feel hopeful and optimistic about the future of education in this country. Um, and also really just be hopeful to understand that, you know, if we all really, um, you know, just band together and uh, cut across differences and, and be accepting that we can, you know, fight really big challenges together. I think resilience is sort of the word of 2020. And I think that will all come out of this in the new year, hopefully um, a lot stronger together and as individuals. And so that's my big hope for the year. Well, that's a great hope. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I just want to you know, thank McDonald's again and also thank you and API scholars for you know, letting me meet you. I really did enjoy chatting with you now and before the program. And uh, of course. <laughs> yeah, uh, now we're going to bring it to the next part of our classroom convos program. Thank you so much, Hudson and Katrina. It was great to hear about uh, McDonald's amazing APIA Scholars Program. And also I really appreciated hearing your both of your personal uh, stories and also 
how the APIA Scholars Program is tackling racism and financial concerns and health concerns for um, APIA youth. So thank you for all the work you're doing. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce our next uh, facilitator for today's workshop. It's Liz Kleinrock. If you don't know Liz Kleinrock, you have to look her up and you're gonna get to meet her now, so, so you don't even have to do that. But she is amazing. Liz Kleinrock is an anti-bias, anti-racist educator and consultant. She is a classroom teacher and facilitator and she received Teaching Tolerance's 2018 Award for Excellence in Teaching. Today's workshop with Liz will cover what it means to be an ally and to show up to fight bullying, hateful, racist rhetoric in the school as a young person. So please welcome the amazing Liz Kleinrock. Hi Malik, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be part of this event today. Thank you so, so much for coming. How are you doing? I'm good. You know, it's another day on Zoom. Um, I'm teaching middle school this year, so we are fully, fully virtual. We have been fully virtual all year. So I'm glad I invested in a really comfortable office chair. I'll just say that. <laughs> Fantastic. Amazing. Um, well, I know that I know that you have a very robust um, program for us today. I saw you posting on social media that you were putting your final touches on just a few hours ago. So I won't take up any more time, but I just want to say thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to um, everything you're going to do today. Awesome. Thank you so much again. All right. Have fun. Thanks. All right. Hey, y'all. Um, it's great to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a slide deck uh, prepped for today, um, and we are going to be talking about how to navigate difficult conversations, um, you know, around speaking up against racism, xenophobia, any sort of bigotry or oppressive language, and just recognizing how challenging it, it can be, especially when it's coming from somebody who you might interact with every day in your school. It might be a close friend. Um, and so I'm hoping to give you all some context, but also some strategies of how to initiate those conversations and how to continue them in a proactive way. All right. All right, so before we begin, um, I like to begin all workshops or any facilitation with an, a land acknowledgement. Um, so today I'm sharing this work with you while residing on the traditional unceded lands of the Piscataway and the Pamukkin Nations um, in the area that is known as Washington, DC. Um, as a community, we recognize the displacement of indigenous peoples on this land and the trauma that still occurs. Indigenous peoples are not of the past. And while colonization has sought to erase and marginalize these communities, indigenous peoples are present and must be centered in our education and activism. Activism. Um, if you want to know more information about whose traditional unceded lands you are currently residing on, you can also check out the website native-lands.ca. Um, so very quickly, some background about me. My name is Liz Kleinrock. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I identify as a Korean-born transracial Jewish adoptee, meaning that I am Asian and I was raised in a white family here in the district. Um, I work closely with the Teaching Tolerance Advisory Board. Um, I have lived in lots of different places around the states, um, grew up here in the city, um, went to school in St. Louis, lived in Oakland, and taught in Los Angeles. And I actually just moved back from California this past summer. Um, I've been in education for about 12 years. Um, I've taught first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grades, currently teaching sixth grade English, um, have done some work with TED, um, facilitated at a number of different museums here in DC and around the country, um, and have an upcoming book coming out actually that focuses on this topic as well. Um, and some fun random information, I love noodles, I love breakfast food, I love watching horror movies, obsessed with reading, and I also have two bunnies and hopefully they won't be too loud in the background because sometimes that happens. All right, so um, for parts of this, I wanna make it interactive because honestly, listening to someone talk at you through a screen is not the most engaging way to learn. So let's talk first about community for a minute. Thinking about the diversity of the United States, regardless of where you live, can we think about what are some of the benefits of being part of a diverse community and some of the challenges that come along with being part of a diverse community? So you're welcome to drop anything in the chat. Um, I can give some, oh, some of my own like takes on this and some of the things that my students have shared, but I really want to make sure that all of your voices are included in this as well. So thinking about sometimes sameness and people being of the same background can be really beneficial in certain ways. And sometimes it can be incredibly challenging and also vice versa. 
And I understand also that putting in your thoughts in a virtual community where there hasn't been a lot of time to build that mutual respect and trust um, because we're strangers coming into this space together can be really hard. So even if you're not comfortable utilizing the chat and sharing your thoughts, thinking about, you know, what are some of the great things about being part of a, such a diverse place? And what are some of the more challenging things that come alongside that too? So with my students, um, we often talk about how wonderful it is that we have the opportunity to learn from different cultures and different backgrounds and experiences. But it also means that a lot of the time that means there are like a lot of cooks in the kitchen too, that when we are coming from our own experiences and identities, being able to recognize and understand different perspectives can be really, really challenging, especially if you are presented with a new opinion. Thank you, Stella, so much. I really appreciate that. In a diverse community, you can find people like you and also learn about other cultures. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we can go to the next one. Okay, so oftentimes in schools or in learning spaces, we'll talk about this idea of like a safe space, you know, where people can like show up and feel completely secure in who they are. And I think we, while that is like a really wonderful ideal, we have to recognize that some folks due to their identities, parts of themselves that are both seen and unseen might actually never feel safe. You know, if you are black, if you're a person of color, that is not something that you can necessarily hide. And depending on your community where you are, that might come um, here with some risk or some danger, depending on like the political and social beliefs of those around you. The same thing if you identify as transgender, if you are of a religious faith um, where you believe in wearing certain clothing or certain garb that makes you distinguishable um, based on your religion, um, that these are some indicators that show that you might not feel safe regardless of whether or not the person holding space for your community promises safety. So instead, I offer this idea of creating a brave space where people can show up as themselves and talk about differences that might be highly personal. And honestly, when we're talking about race, when we're talking about gender or any of our social identity markers, these conversations can also be really challenging in thinking about what we need to do to establish the, our shared need for trust and respect. So even if you are going into a dialogue with someone who might think completely differently than you, how can you start to build these access points for both of you to engage in the conversation so it becomes productive rather than just people yelling at each other. If you pull up any internet article, I'm sure you'll see in the comment thread, people who have no interest in really listening and leaning into discomfort or considering a different perspective. So thinking about what we can do in our friendships and our relationships and our school settings to allow people to show up and ask questions and be curious um, and deepen our understanding of one another. So with my students in school, um, we talk a lot about identity. Um, we talk about it at the beginning of the year a lot, and we also build it in throughout the remainder of the year. Um, if you are not familiar with the person on this slide, her name is Kimberly Crenshaw, and you might be familiar with the term intersectionality, which is a term that she coined. Um, now, a lot of folks tend to use intersectionality as a way to discuss all of the differences and nuances of our identities, that we have so many different things going on at the same time. But there's a lot more to intersectionality than just being different. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw talked about the intersections of our identities um, impact the way that we experience both power and privilege and oppression. And truthfully, our identities have a huge impact on the way we think about political issues and social issues and topics. And for many people, our identities are political based on how we experience power, privilege, and oppression. As an Asian American woman, I'm aware of how my identity has been politicized, looking at different you know, legal statutes within the United States, immigration discrimination acts, um, and also things that have been written about Asian folks in Supreme Court cases as well. Um, and what's really important is to remember that when you are in a position of privilege, and this can absolutely change depending on the community or context you're in, you always have a responsibility to step up. So, for example, you might be in a position on one day where you feel like you don't have privilege. If you're, for example, the only person of color in a community or a room full of white folks. But the next day, if you identify as cisgender and you find yourself in a room where somebody is making transphobic comments, you do hold privilege as that cisgender person and you do have a responsibility to step up.
Now, when I'm talking about stepping up, and we'll get into more of that nuance in a second, I don't mean that you have to step in and save somebody or rescue somebody. If you are ever able to do so, if you get a sense that somebody is being bullied, is being um, possibly targeted based on one of their social identity markers, it's important to first make sure that you have a relationship with that person and also ask how that person wants to be supported um, because each person might prefer you to do something different. They may want you to interrupt um, that conversation or those remarks and other people might prefer to handle it on their own. So that certainly doesn't include places where folks are using like really violent language towards one another, but I do think that relationships are the foundation of all of this work and making sure you're checking in with how folks wanna be supported is really important. Okay, so we also have to think about the kind of culture that we want to create as we are addressing things like bullying, racism, um, that sort of, you know, those sort of violent beliefs, opinions. So thinking about this idea of cancel culture, if you're familiar with the term cancel culture, do you think that cancel culture helps your community or harms your community? And again, you can drop your thoughts into the chat and they'll come up on the screen. Um, but just giving this a couple of thoughts. What do you know about cancel culture? And do you think cancel culture ultimately helps people or does it harm people? Now, whenever I think about cancel culture, um, I find it really interesting because some of the messages that students get, I think, from school and their teachers are often really different than the messages that we get from social media and things that are happening more in like the mainstream worlds. Um, I know as a teacher, one of my goals is to make students feel really secure in the fact that when you make a mistake, those are things that we expect. We expect people to be ignorant on certain topics. We expect people to mess up sometimes. Um, we say that mistakes are expected and they're inspected and they're respected because we all make them. Thank you, Samira. I think cancel culture intends to help, but most of the time it does become harmful. And so I think about my students, especially when I was teaching elementary school, where in school they're hearing all these messages about make mistakes, this is how we grow, this is how we learn, this is how we you know, have to fall off our bike a dozen times before we learn to ride it. But then out in the world, especially on social media, we see people attempting to cancel each other all the time. We see folks bring up things like, well, this person tweeted something that I disagree with back in like 2015, therefore they should be canceled. I'm going to drag them on the internet. I am going to try to get them fired from their job. They should never work again. Everybody in society should shun them. Um, now, I absolutely understand in the case where, you know, folks are using racial slurs when they've done really problematic things. Um, that we have those reactions, but as an educator who truly believes in the power of restorative justice um, and just education as a whole, our job is to create these teachable moments to educate people to do better. The way I think about cancel culture means that if we subscribe to cancel culture, we're almost giving up on people. We're saying whatever you thought at this point in time is who you are forever. And there isn't any opportunity for growth for discovery and especially for unlearning because unlearning is such a huge part of activism and anti-racism. We all have biases. It's one of our common denominators as people. And so when we begin to recognize that we have problematic beliefs and we learn better, then we do better. Thank you, Rose, I appreciate that. It focuses more on shunning rather than correcting. Absolutely. I right, can go to the next one. All right, so this beautiful graphic was put together by my friend Britt Hawthorne, and I love it. She calls it the pyramid of accountability. So I like to think about how we're showing up for ourselves and we're showing up for other people. Now, I used to use the term ally a lot. Um, I talked about allyship and the importance of being an ally to like the queer community, um, to folks of color, to those who are disabled. Um, and then I began to think more about this label. And I also began to read more, listen more, and learn more from other educators, other activists. And in the past couple of years, a lot of my language has shifted from using ally instead to accomplice and co-conspirator. Um, I find that a lot of folks tend to use ally as a label. Like I am an ally. Like I have a rainbow, rainbow flag on my door. I put a black square on Instagram for Black Lives Matter. I wear a pink knitted hat to show solidarity with women. 
women. Um, and while that is certainly a start, I often worry that people who use the term ally to describe themselves sometimes are missing out on the action that needs to come along with that. I actually really like the terms accomplice and co-conspirator because those terms are rooted in action. And although accomplice and co-conspirator sometimes have a negative connotation, you think about like a bank robber, accomplice or co-conspirator. Um, I love the focus on action and the idea that there is inherently a risk that you take knowingly to give up your privilege, to give up some of your own protection that comes along with that privilege to work alongside those who are marginalized or those who are being bullied instead of just standing alongside with them. Okay. So in this case, if we're not going to cancel people, what are we going to do? Um, I remember being in school and I remember the challenge of when your classmate makes, makes a joke um, and everybody laughs and you might be the only person in the room who doesn't think it's very funny um, that you can so easily be labeled a snowflake or being teased for saying you're so overly sensitive or it's just a joke, why can't you take it? Um, and in certain situations, I like to use techniques um, that are called either calling folks out or calling folks in. Now, I think there's actually a very big difference between trying to cancel somebody and trying to call someone out. When I think about language around calling out, it means that a line has been crossed and someone's words or actions are not acceptable and it's important to let them know in that moment. Um, I know that I have been in situations where things have been said or done in front of me and I will spend you know, every night for the next week or two or month, or sometimes like a year later, replaying that scenario over in my head, wishing that I had said something or done something, or maybe that I had said something different than the words that came out of my mouth. Um, I think in these situations, as silly as it might sound, but to practice and think about, you know, if I'm in a certain situation, someone says something that is, you know, not very tasteful or offensive, what am I going to say? Do I have certain phrases or responses prepared? So I don't end up in that like fight or flight or freeze moment where you might say something really aggressive that certainly doesn't solve the problem, that you might freeze in your tracks and not say anything, or you might just try to sweep the comment under the rug and just move on pretending that it didn't happen. So some of the phrases on this screen are taken from um, this incredible educator and activist Loretta Ross, as well as another organization, Racial, racial Equity. Um, you can see um, those citations at the bottom. But these are some phrases that I have found really helpful um, when needing to confront somebody who has crossed a line. Maybe they've said something racist or sexist or xenophobic, and I need to let them know that what they said was just not acceptable. Um, some of these statements, I know like it's occasionally hard to imagine yourself saying them in the moment, but again, if you can just even pick one of them um, that really sticks, that really resonates with you and practice saying it so it becomes more of a muscle memory response so you're not fumbling for words in those moments. And on the next slide, um, the opportunity to call somebody in. Um, I prefer call-in responses personally, but I see these as when there's an opportunity to educate someone, to connect across differences. Um, when there is what I might call a teachable moment here and the person seems to be open or receptive to receiving feedback. Um, things like, you know, I'm curious about why you said that. What was your intention here? Or even if you didn't have a negative intention, what sort of impact do you think those words might have? And especially um, if there's somebody of that identity in the room with you. Um, and even pushing back on, you know, what kinds of assumptions might you be making about a certain person or a group of people? Now, the next tools that we can use um, ouch and oops. I use these a lot in the facilitation with adults when certain, um, we might call them like sensitive topics might be coming up. And while you might not feel comfortable saying like ouch or oops, like to your groups of friends, um, recognizing that if you, we can start to internalize some of these, like when we might actually be the ones who are saying something offensive or harmful to someone else, how do we take responsibility for it? Or if somebody tells you, oh, actually you said something that was really harmful or that hurt my feelings, how can you receive that without becoming defensive? So if somebody says something along the lines of, ouch, like you said something or did something that harmed me, being able to accept 
that feedback, to acknowledge the impact. Even if your intention was not to harm that person, we still have to make sure that we're taking responsibility for how we make others feel, that we meaningfully apologize. Um, and then we can also think about how we're going to adjust our language, our behavior for the future. Um, now, if you can self-monitor yourself and notice that you said something or did something harmful, you can call yourself in and say, oh, you know what, I'm actually really struggling. I think I just said something really harmful. That was really unfair. I'm really sorry. Or oh, like I just saw some of you like roll your eyes. It looks like I said something that didn't really sit well. Can you tell me what I said so I can fix it? And so finally, I talked a little bit about this importance of impact over intent. Um, and sometimes in schools, in group settings, we talk about the importance of having positive intentions. Um, while it's great to go in assuming that people do have positive intent, again, it is so important to own your impact. Um, I know that especially when folks might offer a correction, it might be really hard to receive that. Um, instead of saying things like, you know, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way and placing the blame on that, that person, thinking about the ways that you can take responsibility by saying, you know, I'm sorry that I said something offensive. Like, I will do better in the future. I didn't realize. Thank you for telling me. All right. Um, Last but not least, um, this is something that one of my really good friends, Shay Martin, says, um, this idea that accountability is really a radical act of love. Um, I think for a lot of folks, when we think about accountability, it sounds really great in theory, you know, that people are going to hold us to high expectations, that if we make mistakes, people will correct us. Abstractly, it sounds really, really great, but in practice, it can be really hard. Quite often, accountability might feel like criticism um, because somebody is pointing out something where you made a mistake, where you did something wrong, and you know we're all human. There is a lot of shame and embarrassment that sometimes can come alongside that. The way that I like to think about accountability, though, like if I say something stereotypical or harmful, um, if a friend or a colleague of mine is offering you know, that call in or call out, I see that as a radical act of love because it means that they care enough about our friendship. It means they care enough about our relationship to offer that correction, to do that emotional labor of educating me about why what I said or what I did was not okay. And also giving me examples of things that I can do to improve in the future. Those people don't have to do that. They choose to do that. And so I'm hoping that some of these tools and strategies today can really mirror this idea for all of you in your own lives, that when you're holding your friends accountable, it means that you love them. It means that you care about them. And it also means that if your friends hold you accountable and let you know that you're doing something harmful, it means that they love you too. Um, this pillar is just, it's so incredibly important because again, like none of us are perfect. We are all on this lifelong journey of activism, of anti-bias and anti-racist work, of figuring out who we are and who our friends and our classmates and those in our communities are too. You know, we are ignorant of way more things than we are knowledgeable about. And it's going to stay that way for pretty much your entire life. But just knowing that everybody has different access points, this work very much exists along a spectrum. There's no finish line to cross, but we're also not all starting at the same place, too, based on our life experiences. But again, when you know better, we can do better. Um, so finally, um, I use these a lot of my workshops, might not be as necessary here, but this is my contact info. So um, if you're a student and there's anything going on that you would wanna discuss or need advice or a thought partner on, this is my contact information. Please feel free to get in touch. Um, and again, thank you so much Act to Change uh, McDonald's, Next Shark for having me here today. Um, it has been lovely talking to all of you. So thank you very much. Liz, thank you so much. Um, for all of you watching now, if you did not know Liz before now, you know that I was not wrong. She is a complete um, and total rock star. You know, Liz, I just want to say that even as a chair of an anti-bullying organization, I still know how challenging it can be to speak up and also to enter a space that feels unsafe and how, uh, you know, we constantly have to work to ensure that we are helping people in the way that they actually want to be helped. So I just want to say that I'm really, really grateful for the conversation and tools that you opened up 
um, around that. And I also want to let you know that I know that a few comments came up on the screen, but I was I was watching like this this uh, this event is being co-streamed on a couple of different YouTube channels. And there were so many amazing comments that we didn't get to share. So uh, <laughs> people seem, yeah, people seem like super engaged. And I think it's just, just goes to show that um, everybody watching here really appreciates the experience um, and Lens as an educator and a facilitator that you bring to share with young people and families around how they can be, um, I'm gonna say allies, but I know that I know that you talked about being a conspirator uh, and how they can fight bullying and discrimination. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you one quick question though. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your book. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. So I just turned in the final manuscript like two weeks ago. It feels very strange to like have all my free time back. Um, so clearly I'm just diving into more projects because I like to stay busy. Um, so it's coming out in May with Heinemann Publishing. Um, right now the working title is Start Here, Start Now. Um, and it is a book for educators or people who work with young people and really wanna develop their own like anti-bias and anti-racist work. Um, so it's a lot of like anecdotes from my teaching experience as well as like lesson plans and resources. Um, my hope is that after educators and folks read this, there will be no reason for them not to engage in this kind of work in classrooms. So like if you teach really young kids, if you teach like math and science and you're not quite sure like what anti-racism has to do with STEM subjects, like hopefully there's something for everyone. Wow, that's, that's incredible. And I just wanna say that as, uh, is this your first book? Yeah. <laughs> So as, as someone who, who wrote a book that came out last year, uh, I know how incredibly time consuming that process <laughs> is. So welcome back to your life. And, uh, and thank, you, thank you so much for sharing that. And I hope that um, everybody will get a chance to check out uh, your book and your teachings. And thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Have a great night. Always. <clears throat> All right, um, I'm excited to introduce our final panel for today's Classroom Convo. Um, in just a moment, we're gonna welcome back Hudson Yang, who is gonna be facilitating a panel with a couple of Gen Z influencers who I think you will all recognize from YouTube. Together, they have a combined audience of over 150,000 subscribers. And today they're gonna be sharing their experiences and stories both as college students and as content creators. So please welcome back Hudson Yang, along with Katie Yu and Sean Rizwan. Hi guys. I, by the way, I just want to say that I am definitely not cool enough to be on this panel, but I just want to say hi to Neither all. Am I. What am I doing here? But <laughs> um, Thank you so much for, for being here today. Have, have a great time and I'll check in with you guys uh, at the end. All right, all right. I just want to thank everyone in the comments too for being so interactive last, like the, for the last panel. Like that, that was more comments than in all my classes so far this semester. So I'm pretty impressed. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, how you guys doing? Excited to have you guys on. Uh, you guys want to talk about yourselves? Yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Sean Rizwan. Um, I am a content creator on YouTube. I make videos about college, my life, and I'm also juggling that with being a student at Boston College, a senior. All right, and hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Katie Yu, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a 20 year old Korean American college student attending Brown. I started my YouTube channel due to an existential crisis during the lockdown. Um, best decision I've ever made though, <laughs> but um, what else? I'm obsessed with Kermit memes, TikTok, and I'm currently tuning in from my house in Arizona. Yeah. And wait, before we start, I wanted to, I was going to ask you, Hudson, about, I was stalking your Twitter before, oh, wow. and I was, <laughs> I was very shook that you were about to take the SATs today. You know what? I was that's too. not. Normal. I was too. I was very scared, but, <laughs> but lucky, lucky me. It's happened. Right. Now. It got canceled. So I'm just like dodging the bullets left and right. I'm literally just in the matrix, but um, exactly. Well, I'm happy for you, but it must also kind of suck to just like study and then. Cut all you know what? I'll be honest. I didn't do that much study. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so it was worth it. I, I don't study for many tests. My grades are great, but I don't study. Uh, and I was hoping okay, that the same would happen for the SATs. Uh, I took a practice; it did not happen, and I got real <laughs> sad because I was like last week. Um, <laughs> Oh God! Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I, I'm glad I missed it. So um, maybe I'll take it after I study. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I'm glad. It worked out for the best. <laughs> yeah. 
um, anyways, let's jump right into the conversation. Sure. <laughs> Especially following the great session before, it's gonna be hard to follow, but um, you know, figuring out how to be an ally and advocate. You guys both have a large audience on YouTube and you got yours pretty fast. Um, I'm sure that kind of platform gets you thinking about how to use it to advocate for like, you know, people who can't really speak out as much. And I gotta ask you both, what ways are you both being allies and actively advocating during this online learning and uh, and or in-person classes in college and high school and such? Right, so I'll be really honest and open here. Like my most substantial and personal growth um, as a person, an ally and an accomplice, now that Liz is saying to use that word, I like it a lot better. Um, it's directly coincided with like the COVID pandemic and the recent resurgence of BLM across the world and social media. Uh, and I would say like my growth on YouTube kind of accelerated that because like obviously the platform gifted me that voice. And I think obviously with the pandemic, we spent so much time alone. I obviously like many of us have had a lot of time to think and ruminate. And so when I was first starting this channel, I think I had like 30 subscribers at the time. Like one of the first videos I made was an open letter to Asian Americans and loved ones who still struggle to stand with the Black Lives Matter movement because I think a lot of us know as Asian Americans like anti-blackness and complicit silence, like those are issues that our community does struggle with at times. And making that video before I even had a following, it, it sparked something in me because I would say it was the first time I ever like had any stance, took any stance on anything. Like it was the first time I ever grew a backbone, to be honest. Um, because I think as an Asian, again, I was raised to, you know, follow the rules, keep your head down, like don't really break the system. Um, and like, don't say political stuff because like employers or college admissions and stuff like that. So breaking out of that was actually really scary for me. And, um, but in doing so, it kind of lit a fire in like, silence is not okay and like silence your silence should actually matter in a negative way to the people that you want to work with the colleges you go to your employers and so that is something that by leading by example is something that i hope to advocate for both my viewers who i know a lot of our students and to the people that know me in real life at brown so yeah i definitely feel that it's always really scary to say anything political or anything right detriment like you know controversial on your social media i remember i had the same fear but mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Sean? For sure. Yeah, I, I agree completely with everything Katie said. And yeah, it's crazy to like this past year just to have go from like almost no subscribers to have such a big audience. So I'm always thinking about like every video I post, like what's the impact of it and like what value I can bring to people. And I touch a lot on this in my most recent video and in everything going forward. I always try to provide some sort of positive value with everything I put out. And, you know, um, talking about issues that I'm passionate about and sort of specifically in my content, you know, showing um, what it's really like as a college student and like when I'm having good days, bad days, um, and also sort of incorporating now um, my, you know, my racial identity as like an Asian American and, you know, that sort of representation as well. Um, and yeah, also just in my day to day, um, holding people accountable and being able to have sort of those difficult conversations with my friends and family. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I'm sure everyone's already experienced something like this, but what ways have you guys experienced bullying or discrimination or if you have seen other people experiencing it while at school? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for most of my like academic career, like going like elementary school, middle school, high school, I went to a primarily white, uh, primarily white environments. And so a lot of it was um, not as much like overt, like discrimination, like, um, like racism and things, but it was more just um, being surrounded by so many people that weren't Asian, I sort of, felt like a pressure to like fit in. And so um, fitting in basically meant that I um, sort of repressed a lot of my cultural identity, my ethnic background and, you know, talking about like, like my culture and like wanting to learn about my culture. Um, but once I got to college, I sort of realized, you know, that the importance of learning about those things, once I like met other Asian people 
and you know coming to college with a lot more perspectives i came to yeah i came to realize that i wasn't the only person that sort of experienced that like isolation of being afraid to express who you are and so now i'm very um very excited about being able to learn about my culture and continue to learn more Oscar. yeah and i think going off that the most vivid experience and I, I think a lot of people can relate you know when you're so excited to pack your favorite meal that your mom makes you and then the first time you bring it to the cafeteria like some kid some rude kid has to comment how it smells so bad like how it smells like poop or something that happened multiple times <laughs> obviously and it, it's really sad and like now growing up and obviously I go home that day and say like mom only pack me burgers and I think going looking at that perspective now um it, it makes me sad to think about like what my parents felt you know like hearing that from their kid who like they brought to this country to have a better life and then like having them like feel the pain of like something that they can't control um i think that is like something that i really like resonate with now because i'm older but little things like that build up and obviously like sean said just growing up around people that didn't really look like you or like especially when like you get into your puberty years and like you want to like you have a crush on a guy and they like they don't like you back and stuff like that it's it's little things like that and i i feel like college has really also helped me break out of that because there is so much culture and color and like communities that organize around those things and like call to action and so i'm i feel very very blessed to have found like my community and like be proud of my culture again. Um, and yeah. Um, would you say that things are kind of changing? Cause I feel like personally my experience is that, you know, I experienced people saying my food is gross mm -hmm. and that it looked like worms or whatnot. Even on the show, we talked about it, but in real life it happened too. But I think also recently I've noticed that people have started to really appreciate, uh, you know, different cultures, especially like Asian cultures, Asian foods, mm -hmm. like sushi and ramen and even just noodles have become a huge part of American culture too. I mean, I would say hopefully we're taking steps in the right direction. It's kind of like that. two step forward, one step back. You know, we're taking one direction with the younger generation and then a whole another direction elsewhere. But you know, that's less important. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so how have you seen your classmates and friend really step up and take a lead or anyone really take a lead in 2020, whether it's in response to you know, COVID-19 or racism or really anything at all? Have you seen any really good leaders or in your community? Yeah, um, I think it's a lot of it is, um, I feel like a lot of our generation now is a lot more vocal about issues that matter, especially with the rise of social media and technology. Like um, it's given a lot of power to young people to really take matters into their own hands and use their voice. And they don't have to wait on other people to make things happen. So, you know, I see that both with my friends on social media, they're very vocal and also doing a lot of big things to stand up for causes they believe in. And also, um, yeah, you can just see it on in the media, on social media, just so many young people are um, just going for it and you know using their voice, which is really awesome to see. I mean, segueing off that, you both you know have a really pretty big following now. Do you think that success has changed the way you feel about creating content and using your voice and, you know, pushing harder than you did before? I I think it's a mix of both because on one hand, when you have no followers or no subscribers and you're grinding, like putting in 20, 30 hours into a video and nobody watches it, it's like a different type of pain. It hurts so bad. Um, <laughs> so in that way, it's become very, it's so much easier to like grind because like so many people like show love and it, it's like, I love interacting with everybody who watches it and comments like it, it's a lot easier in that mm. way. But then I would say it's harder in that you put pressure on yourself to constantly outperform yourself and like create better and better videos because you want to give like your all to these viewers and people who support you, like you want to improve for them. And so that pressure is like what I would say like makes the journey a little bit harder, but I'm grateful to be having any of these problems or grappling with these issues. <laughs> so yeah, I would say, yeah. Yeah, abso absolutely, yeah. I. Yeah, like the comments, the DMs you get on social media, like when I post a video, all these nice comments. I actually mm -hmm. like, I screenshot some of them and like when I'm feeling down and need some motivation, <laughs> I'll like look at every like album. <laughs> but just know that everyone watching, Same, I, like, yeah. I read every comment, try to engage as much as I can because if someone's taking their time to write something, like I feel like they deserve 
um, some yeah. attention. Um, I did the same yeah, thing. I also, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Your comments, it's like, oh, I feel so good. <laughs> exactly. But then at the same time, yeah, what what Katie was saying, um, basically, like, yeah, as you continue to grow and you have so many eyes on you, there's so much pressure, you know, like you want every video to do well, but um, you have to remember at the same time why you're doing it in the first place is because you enjoy it and okay. are having fun. Period. But I mean, you know, it's not all nice things. You know, the internet really is a Period. toxic and hateful place. I mean, do you guys have any folk like tips for people who kind of have gone through the hate and the you know, the negative comments and trolls online. Like, how have you guys dealt with it? Should I go first? I can go first. Yeah, okay. I'll <laughs> say, I, this is, I'm not sure if I recommend this for everybody, but basically what I do is I go and, like, binge watch Jimmy Kimmel series on, like, celebrities read me tweets, or, like, I watch, like, Emma Chamberlain's video of, like, reacting to hate comments. Like, I watch those to, like, remind myself that, like, icons still get hate comments and, like, people will still, some people will still like stoop to that level. Um, and so it just, it comforts me to realize like it's it's inevitable and I'm just like keeping in mind that like everybody goes through it. And those people are like people that don't know you and you don't know them. So like, just try to block it out, I would say. Sean, anything else? Any other yeah, advice? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky. I feel like like the community I've like created, I guess, like everyone is super nice and like hate comments are very rare, but you know, like when I get them, like, before in the past, like I'd read it and it would honestly like ruin my day or like my week, I'd think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think one way that has been helpful is, you know, to talk about it, like to other people be like, like really vent out your feelings. And I think other people can help um, put into perspective, like this is just some random person on the internet. Like you shouldn't really care that much what they say, they don't know you. Also, I feel like it just they hate you because they ain't you, you know? They're mm -hmm. just jealous of your success and your incredibleness. All that stuff, and but. I would say, like, I dream of my first hate comment. I said that's for so long. I was like, I dream of getting my first hate comment. Like, it means that I'm yeah. going somewhere. So. That, means you're, that means you're popping. That's your first sign okay. of success. If someone hates you, Period. you're something right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, I guess, you know, the last thing is what final message you guys have for like young people and their families as we – continue to find a way and navigate through this, you know, strange pandemic and weird life and possibly, hopefully not, but possibly extend the virtual learning space. Yeah, but yeah. I, this is a very um, unique time we're in. Definitely very difficult with online learning and the pandemic. Like I've certainly struggled a lot these past few months, like having to do online classes because it's definitely not like the same thing as like college. Like it's not as engaging. It might be hard to focus just because it's online or like a bunch of other factors, especially like the pandemic. But um, if there's like one or a few takeaways I can give is just um, in your day-to-day -day lives, you know, this is a very um, tough time, but don't be afraid to um, open up to other people and be vulnerable with how you're feeling, like your friends, your family. Um, in your classes, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, your professors, your classmates, um, I'm sure everyone is knows it's a difficult time and they want to be accommodating so that's what i would say yeah and and going off that i i would say the main thing that i want to tell anybody who's watching is like be nice to yourself um i have trouble taking this advice for myself sometimes but i i feel like we we're not giving ourselves enough credit for the amount of degree that this world has changed and like us being expected to operate normally continue to excel at everything we're doing we just put a lot of pressure on ourselves to just be the same even when like the emotion or turmoil turmoil is like through the roof and so i just really want to encourage everyone to like be nice to yourselves and i'm praying for everybody who is like being hurt by this pandemic by all the oppression that's going on and just yeah just self-care you know take care of yourselves yeah that one hit that one, that one that one came real yeah. exactly. <laughs> that one was real yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah but you know thank you guys so much for being here today it was really a great conversation Thank you for Beyond having me. Beyond expectations, you know. Yes, um, thank you. And I'm obsessed with, I, I love Fresh Off the Boat. So <laughs> I'm honored. I'm, I really I'm am. Honor, um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was really cool to learn more about you guys. And I, I yeah. really, I can't wait to see you guys in your next YouTube videos. And I'm I'm really happy you guys got to you know, share your vulnerabilities, share your stories, mm -hmm. and kind of be here and talk with me. Um, mm -hmm. you now, closing message is that everyone out there, you guys as well, you're not alone. You know, at, we're here to support you. Um, you can reach out to me on my Instagram and hit me up in my DMs. I will respond if you need help. Um, but anyways, thank you guys so much for joining us on this panel. And thank you, commenters, for being here and watching. And be good. Yeah. Woo! <laughs>
I said that I was not quite prepared to pop up here because I like literally have tears in my eyes. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It's so easy for people to look from the outside to look at like social media and influencers as this kind of like shallow, you know, a uh, uh, very, very kind of um, selfish world. But in fact, what we just saw here today, it's so clear why so many people have glommed on to all of you because you're so open and authentic and vulnerable. And like, I just really appreciate everything that you shared about your own personal experiences. And you truly are uh, the role models that, that all young people and certainly young AAPI people. Uh, need today. So thank you so much for being here. I really thank appreciate you. I just want to call out one funny comment too when I was reading. If someone what? said, um, this comment section gives me hope for the future. Now I was like <laughs> holding my gloves and I was like, okay. But yeah. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. It is to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to say a big thank you again to um, to all of our amazing activists, our social justice educators, our social media influencers, celebrity hosts uh, for joining us today for the second classroom combo that, that is being hosted in partnership with McDonald's and Next Shark. Uh, you all are inspiring myself and so many of us here that are watching every single day with the work that you are doing. Uh, let's all continue to speak out against harassment and bullying against the AAPI community. And let's ensure that all the spaces that we are a part of are inclusive and safe for everyone. All of us watching here today can truly make a difference and positively impact our communities. Um, before we close out, I wanna make sure that you all know about our upcoming Kindness Heals digital art exhibit. We're partnering with two amazing organizations, the Daniel K. Inouye Institute and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center to showcase AAPI youth art made by you. So whether it be a video or a digital graphic or anything that you feel expresses your voice, your point of view, uh, we want to hear from you. We are already started, started, excuse me, we already started taking submissions and we will continue taking them until mid-January uh, through Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, we're also currently running our giving season fundraiser. We have an ambitious, but I think very achievable goal of raising $20,000 by the end of the year uh, to support our anti-bullying initiatives. I'm super grateful to all of you who have already donated and everyone who's watching today, if you can donate, any amount, uh, it would greatly, uh, greatly help our work in ending bullying for Asian American and Pacific Islander youth. And of course, a huge thank you to our event partners, to McDonald's, uh, to NextShark, and also to all of our YouTube cross-posting partners like Teach for America, Stage 13, Tan France, and Jasmine Shao of Study Quill. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also wanna thank all of our board members at Act to Change. Everybody worked so hard to put this programming uh, on for all of you because we are truly committed to uplifting our mission to ending bullying for Asian American and Pacific Islander youth and to also build solidarity with all youth. Together, we can end bullying. Thank you. <laughs>